Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all and welcome to the channel. In this video, we will cover byte codes and the constant pools. And we will see how they are closely related to one another. And we will also see the importance of these two, or more specifically, the importance of this file <clears throat> with regards to the remainder of the language processing system or the steps, the remaining steps of the language processing system, which include the loading, linking and initialization. But before we begin, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen, Sayyiduna Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin. وارض اللهم عنا معهم أجمعين اللهم آمين <تصفيق> اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد We begin in the name of Allah the most merciful in this life and in the hereafter we thank him for all of his blessings that he has bestowed upon us, for they are innumerable. And we pray that we follow in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his fellow companions. Amen. <clears throat> we also ask for prayers and blessings to be bestowed upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family, as they were bestowed upon Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, and his family. Now, before we actually start with byte codes and the constant pool, let us review how this byte code is generated or is created. Uh, let me grab uh, this and this, like so here and here. So in this box or in this step we have the source code written in a high level programming language which in our case is java and the file has the dot java extension like so as we have mentioned previously the processing uh, system or the cpu of the computer does not understand English, so it will not understand the source code. To execute the program, it needs the code to be written in its own language, which is the binary language, a series of zeros and ones. These zeros and ones instruct the computer and that is uh, so the series of zeros and ones is the input the computer or the cpu processes the information the input so it basically reads the set of instructions it is provided and based upon these instructions the computer provides the output through the execution of the program <clears throat> Now, through the first step of the Java language processing system, which is compilation, the source code is translated to a low-level programming language known as bytecode. And that has the dot class file extension. Now, what is the bytecode, we mentioned this in previous sessions. The bytecode is the assembly language specific to the Java virtual machine. Let us review briefly what we covered with regards to assembly language. Uh, let me write here the name of the compiler in case you have forgotten java c that is the name of the compiler 
or the common one. There are other compilers, of course. <clears throat> But this is the one I am currently using, so I will be teaching based on what I use. That way, the theoretical portion is connected to the practical portion. If you recall from the, I believe it was the language processing system lecture, but the general concepts one, or rather the process that occurs in the, uh, the C language, which is the origin of the modern high-level programming languages such as Java and of course C++ and C Sharp but yeah we mentioned that at least in that lecture we have the source code which will be .c because it is the C language and then this code is, uh, where is the arrow? Yep. Is compiled, which is another term for translated to assembly language. This is the language that contains the instructions the CPU can understand. It is still in English, but, uh, but I will explain what the difference between the instructions here and the instructions here uh, uh, lies. We will cover that in just a moment. So this will be the compiler in this scenario. For example, personally, I use uh, GCC. That is the name of the compiler I personally use. It is it stands for GNU uh, Collection Compiler, if I recall correctly. You, we will discuss this later when when I start the C programming tutorial. Bi'ithnillah and God willing. Then this assembly language is translated yet again because this is still in English it is translated yet again to uh, the text machine code or binary code either or and uh, let me uh, there we go the translator in this scenario is not known as a compiler, but since it is translating assembly language, then the translator is known as an assembler, which is why this direction is known as this assembly, as opposed to this direction, which is assembly. So if we are returning in that direction, we are disassembling the code. The same applies here for Java, but we still did not cover this portion in Java yet. Uh, where is the arrow? Here. And then we have, uh, no, not, not that color let us go with this color and this will be machine code or binary code like that and the translator here well we have two translators but we will only mention one for simplicity and that is the interpreter. We also have the JIT compiler, but we will cover those later. So as you can see, <coughs> the steps. Uh, hold on just one moment. Yeah, there we go. The steps mirror one another. Like so. And let me just push this here and push these here so what does that tell you it tells you that there is a relationship between the bytecode and assembly language 
If you are learning assembly language or if you are familiar with assembly language, you would know that assembly language is the language specific to a particular processor or a particular CPU. For example, if you have a computer made by Intel, the computer company, then the assembly language for that computer would be specific to Intel processors as opposed to, for example, if you have a processor designed by another company, such as Motorola, then that would have its own assembly language. Both follow the same logic, but they could differ in syntax. For example, the uh, I am unfamiliar with the Intel assembly language, but I am just giving an example. The loading instruction in Motorola could be written in a particular format or using a particular spelling, but the load instruction for Intel would use a different spell spelling. Just as an example, but both follow the same process, the same concept, and the same flow. Since the Java virtual machine mimics or mirrors an actual processor, hence the term virtual machine, as opposed to a physical machine that takes actual space, which is the CPU, the Java virtual machine occupies virtual space, so it does not exist. Since it mirrors or mimics a processor, it needs its own assembly language. That is what is known as the bytecode. So as you can see here, I aligned them together to remind you that there is a connection between assembly language and byte code. The only difference is that this assembly language depends on your own machine, your own CPU. This is specific to and only specific to the Java virtual machine. This does not mean that the Java virtual machine never interacts with your actual physical machine or your CPU, it does. Otherwise, the code will never be executed because you need the CPU's output and you need the CPU's intervention. But this is eventually transformed to actual machine code and that is what your CPU understands. Now let us return to the assembly language. Unfortunately, the scope of this lecture or this tutorial series in general does not include assembly language because it focuses only on Java, though I may host a, like a, a tutorial series for assembly language and God willing in the near or possibly far future. But I will explain briefly uh, the importance or rather the structure of assembly language so that it can be easier for you to understand bytecode when we tackle it in this lecture and God willing. I will write a simple code in Java that involves three variables. Num1 and I will assign it the value 5 num2 and I will assign it the value 10 and num3 and I will assign it the sum of num1 and num2 like so. This is an incredibly simple program that any human can understand. Well, I do, by any, I do not mean people who do not understand programming language. They may have difficulty understanding this. But regardless, it is easy to understand whether you are a programmer or not. The problem is the computer does not understand any of this. So as we have mentioned countless times, we need to translate it into a language that the computer does understand. The problem is 
the structure of the CPU. Th there is a certain structure to the CPU or a certain architecture to the CPU that allows the computer to process the input it is receiving, which are these instru instructions, to provide you with the output you seek. For example, in this scenario, if I wish to display the value of num3, that could be our output. Because the CPU has a particular architecture, these instructions are incompatible with the, uh, with the CPU. Thus, the CPU will be unable to process this information. What does that mean? It means that these simplistic instructions must be translated to a language that heavily and directly interacts with the architecture of the CPU. And that is the assembly language or bytecode, either or, because they are the same. Except for the syntax, of course, it would differ, but it is the same concept. The assembly language understands the architecture of the CPU and it understands the relationship between various components within the CPU. That is why the assembly language is able to transform these simplistic yet incompatible instructions to a more compatible form, more specifically compatible to the architecture of the CPU. Just as an example to clarify this, if I speak with a person who has suffered an injury, for example, and he lost two fingers from his right hand. So now he only has three fingers instead of five. And I would like for him to count to 10 using both hands that task is incompatible with his disability because he only has seven fingers. So it is difficult for him to count to 10 using individual fingers. This is a similar analogy to what we have with regards to assembly language. The CPU has a particular architecture that it needs to process information, thus, the input must match this architecture. Because this is too simplistic, the computer will be unable to process it, so it must be converted to assembly language, which is compatible with the architecture of the CPU. Let us cover a brief example to how this will appear as assembly language. Just a brief example, it is not actual assembly language, but it is used to clarify the concept for you regarding assembly language. Again, this lies beyond the scope of our lecture, but I would like to take this time to explain it briefly so that you understand bytecode once we delve deeper into it in this lecture. Insha'Allah bi'ithnillah and God willing. Now let us take a look. Firstly, we have this variable here. How will the computer, your CPU, interact with this instruction set? Well, in assembly language uh, or, uh, or bytecode, the instruction set will be uh, here. Load number five into register A, for example. What is a register? Briefly, register is temporary storage within the CPU. We will return to that in just a moment, but let us cover the remaining instruction sets. Then it will come to this instruction set. In assembly language, it would look similar to this load 10 
into register B, just as an example. Let us say the CPU has a register called B or and a register called A, also known as accumulator A or accumulator B. Then here, load sum of 5 and 10 into register A. So as you can see, uh, why is it? Uh, okay, it is that long. So as you can see, in assembly language, the instructions are different than in Java. Let us cover what a register is before we, or rather let us finish the instruction set. Then you will find an extra instruction that is not present here. Remember, this is a primitive value. Primitive values are stored on what is known as a stack memory, which we will cover later. Do not worry, I have not forgotten. But here it is implicit, implicitly implied that this variable is stored into the stack. However, because computers are dumb, you need to instruct them for every single step taken, which means that assembly language needs to explicitly inform the CPU that this is a primitive variable and it needs to be stored in the stack memory. So you will have an additional instruction that says store sum of 5 and 10, which is 15, in stack memory, like so. So as you can see, the instructions in assembly language are completely different than what we type in Java. Why? Because the assembly language is compatible with the architecture of the CPU. Now let us cover registers quickly so that you are aware of what a register is. We will move. Uh, actually, yeah, this, this space is enough. We have the input that is being received by the CPU. Uh, so let us use this. This arrow represents the input that the CPU is receiving, which is what? This is an input, this is an input, and this is an input. So let us cover the first input, which is load 5 into register A. So here we will put the number 5 as input. Now once the CPU receives this number, it allocates it to a specialized unit known as arithmetic logic unit. As the name implies, it is responsible for arithmetic operations such as addition here. But we will not delve into that topic. Uh, perhaps I can host a tutorial for processor architecture in the far future, bi'idhnillah and God willing. And let me design the, uh, the registers before I forget. <laughs> so here we have register A or accumulator A, either or. And uh, let us use a different color for register B. Like so. Perfect. So this 5 is then allocated or transferred to register A like so for temporary storage. What is the second input? We have 10 here. So let us add 10 here. Now, according to the instructions within the assembly code, it needs to be stored in register B of the CPU. So the CPU complies after processing the information, which basically means reading the instruction 
and it takes the number 10 and adds it to register A. The problem is the CPU only has two registers. So how can it calculate the sum in this scenario? Quite simply, it adds the two numbers, then stores the result in one of the registers while emptying the other register. So the instruction here orders the CPU to store the sum in register A, which is what it will do. So it will add the two numbers. Here it will empty register B. So B is now ready to receive more input if the, if, uh, the need arises. And it adds the two numbers together. So here I will perform a trick like so. And there. So now we have 15 in register A, stored in register A, and B is now empty in case there is further input that needs to be stored temporarily. <coughs> Now for the final input, which is this instruction, store the sum in the stack. Now I will have to draw the stack. <coughs> uh, let us pretend that this is the stack. And I will write it here, stack. And of course, stack, st the stack is comprised of multiple memory blocks. So I will simulate different memory blocks or memory addresses like so. Then the CPU grabs 15 from the register, the temporary storage, and stores it in the stack like so. That is the purpose of the temporary storage, to handle operations quickly before manipulating the data or transferring the data elsewhere. A good example to this to uh, uh, mimic registers in reality, at least I think it is a good example, would be solving mathematical questions in an exam. In the exam, so for uh, let us say for example, you have a question here with so here is your question let us pretend that this is the question and then you have uh, let us say th four choices to choose from now because it is a mathematical question you will need to calculate before you uh, before you have an answer so you decide to calculate in your workout sheet, for example, or on the side of the paper, just as an example. And you calculate, you keep writing different steps. But once you have the answer, you are able to make a choice. What you have written here is temporary it is not necessary you just need one line out of the entire entire process so this is temporary it serves no purpose other than a quick calculation before you have the final answer this is similar to or is analogous to the registers for quick calculations that will not be stored ever again. So you can, after you retrieve your answer, you are free to delete this or erase it. You do not need it anymore because you have your answer. This is similar to the purpose of the registers in computers. Here it performed a quick calculation, then transferred the, the result elsewhere. Now the registers are free to accept more input and transfer them to the stack should the need arise. I hope this has clarified assembly language and registers for you. If not, I apologize. Uh, 
If you have any questions, as always, feel free to ask them in the comments or you can contact me directly. Uh, I do not know if YouTube allows direct contact, but I do have my Discord tag uh, in the welcome page or the about me page uh, on my channel. Feel free to add me and we can discuss any questions you may have. Uh, perhaps I can end it here before we tackle the bytecode. Or you know what? Let us see how we can retrieve the assembly instructions from the bytecode. Then we will end it there before we tackle the relationship between the bytecode and the constant pool. That way you are not overwhelmed with too much information in one lecture because the relationship between the bytecode and the constant pool is could be slightly confusing. At least I was confused initially when I researched it. So I do not want to overwhelm you any further, particularly since we covered assembly language, albeit briefly, of course. So what I will do is I will create a simple Java program, then compile it to <clears throat> yield the bytecode. After that, I will show you how to retrieve the assembly instructions from that bytecode. But before I forget, the reason bytecode is known as bytecode is because it is comprised of a series of bytes, also known as a byte stream. We covered streams with respect to inputs and outputs, but we did not cover its proper definition. We will cover that later, and God willing. Once we tackle Java I.O., also known as Java input and output. But the reason it is called the bytecode is because it is comprised of bytes, hence the term bytecode. And that also reduces its size. That is why bytecodes uh, are quite light. They are not uh, a burden in, uh, on the memory. Now let us start the translation. So what I will do is I will create a simple program here, store it on the desktop, compile it, and then retrieve the information from the bytecode. Public... Uh, class main and then end it here then I will add the main method public static void main open the curly braces close the curly braces <clears throat> add the parameter I forgot I am not uh, on IntelliJ, so I cannot use the macro print line. Uh, welcome to byte code and constant pools. Okay, so I will save this as main.java. Remember the class names must, must match. Save. <coughs> Do not need this anymore. Hopefully I did not make any mistakes. So <clears throat> what I will do is use the command line here. Um, CD. So now I am at the same hierarchy as this file. Java C main dot Java. And here we have the byte class, but because it is uh, in bytes, we are unable to read it. We are able to read a portion of it, but not all of it. There is a method by which we can transform bytes into characters, but I will leave that till the end once we cover Java IO, and God willing, so that we can actually read uh, this file. <clears throat> so now we have 
the bytecode here. How am I able to retrieve the instructions in assembly language? Java P. Remember this instruction or this command that we covered in, I believe it was JDK, the lecture pertaining to JDK. P stands for pool, Java pool. So when you wish to access the constant pool, which is heavily related to the bytecode, we use the Java P instruction for this assembly. Now, uh, I will be providing a link to the full list of the flags that are accompanied by this command, such as hyphen V, hyphen C, hyphen P, and so on and so forth with this video, and the next part or the remaining parts uh, as well, bi-idhnillah and God willing. Now, I keep forgetting if it was P or C. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to specify the name. So I, I wish to target main.class, so I will type main.class. Here you use the dot class extension as opposed to the execution of the program itself. You do not use the extension like so. But for this assembly, you need the extension as you can see here. So I will run the command again. I will type it. Uh, let me enlarge this. Java P space hyphen P main dot class. So as you can see here, it is compiled from main dot Java. What did that do? The hyphen P flag actually prints the source code that was used to compile main.class. So if you would like to investigate the source code provided to you in a class file or in a bytecode file, simply use hyphen p flag or the p flag because normally hyphen indicates a flag for a command anyway, so it would be a bit redundant to say it. Use the P flag with the Java P command or the Java P program or the Java P instruction to retrieve the original source code of that program. But as you can see, it does not print everything, but it does give you an idea that you have a class called main and within it is the main method. What about the instructions now? the assembly language portion, Java P with the flag C, main.class, enter. And as you can see, here are the instructions that are written in assembly language, which is the bytecode. Get static, LDC, invoke virtual return, these are all instructions to the Java virtual machine. These, these are the instructions in assembly language for the Java virtual machine. You do not need to understand them, uh, though I do have a document that explains these instructions if you are interested. Personally speaking, I am not interested in any of this because it, it does not it does not intrigue me. I prefer to work on software development itself, but it does help to understand the architecture or the infrastructure of Java from my opinion anyways, but it is not mandatory to learn Java. Uh, it is not mandatory to understand this to learn Java. That is what I meant. But these are the assembly instructions. Now in the next lecture, بإذنillah and God willing, we will cover these pound signs and these portions here. So do not worry about them for now. I simply wanted to show you an example to the instruction sets or the assembly language of Java it contained within the byte code. So let us return here 
and hmm, I will delete all of this and write the instructions here for you. So, um, byte code this uh, this assembly. I do not believe this is the correct spelling. Let me check. Uh, I believe this is the correct. This oh no, this assembly. Like that. Yeah, I believe that is the correct spelling. If not, English is my second language, so I have an excuse. <laughs> so if you would like to disassemble the bytecode, which is this direction. Uh, let us see here. Source code. Byte code. It is this direction. You are trying to retrieve the source code from the byte code. And this command is Java P with the flag P, then class file name, whichever you call it, dot class. Do not forget to add the extension. Now, what was the second one? Uh, byte code assembly instructions if you would like to retrieve the instructions from your bytecode the command is as, as follows java p with the flag c class file name dot class this provides you with the instructions now of course the instructions contained in bytecode would be much different syntactically to well-known assembly languages, so do not be surprised. But as I mentioned, I believe I have a document that explains each uh, the purpose of each instruction. I hope I have it. I will check, and if I do have it, I will submit it as supplementary material for this lecture. And that is it for this video. In the uh, the upcoming lecture, bi idhnillah and God willing, we will see what uh, the constant pool, how we can access the constant pool, what is the relationship between the constant pool and the bytecode, and finally, we will see, or rather, we will discuss the run time constant pool and yes there is a difference between the constant pool and the runtime constant pool as you may have inferred the constant the runtime constant pool is available during runtime or during execution of the program i hope this video was helpful and beneficial to you all enjoy the rest of your day everyone be safe Take care and peace be upon you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid.